peace. We do believe and receive that the burden of ignorance will dematerialize as we pay attention to the word tonight to your glory. And everybody says, Amen. Well, you want to go with us very quickly to 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. Glory to God. 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. Uh, as we continue with our conversations in current uh, and uh, our conversations on uh, learning to get along with other saints. Okay, now look at this uh, very carefully. Yeah, First Corinthians and chapter 1. I read, it says uh, in verse 2, it, uh, it says, uh, oh, well, let's, let's read from verse 1. It says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and sustains our brother unto the church of God, which is at current. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, both dears and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see that Paul here, uh, as the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, writes unto the church of God. You see, the book of Corinth, just like any of the epistles, are written to the church of God. And it says the church of God, which is at Corinth. Notice that. It says the church of God, which is at Corinth. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus right so uh he writes to the church of god and uh, we are investigating together uh, the implication of this reality called the church of god right the church of god you you mustn't assume uh, that just because uh you use the word church that you understand what church means you see church as used in the epistle uh, is a product of that which jesus said he will fulfill he will bring to pass jesus already said in uh, look at matthew matthew and uh, uh, chapter 16, very quickly. So, Matt, Jesus has already said uh, in Matthew chapter 16, it says in verse 18, And I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, what did he say he will build? He says, I will build my church right? What will he build? My church. That means the church does not belong to you or I. The church is the church of the Lord Jesus. Who will build it? Jesus said he will build it. And so we have to trust him that he, he does what he has said he will do. So Jesus is the one that builds the church. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians and chapter 10 and verse 32. It says, give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So it, this, it differentiates between the church of God and that which is not the church of God. The church of God on one hand, and those that are not the church on the other. Then among those that are not the church, the Jews differentiate themselves from the Gentiles, but they are both not the church of God. They see, the, there were people that were formerly Jews, that when they believed, they became a new nation the church of god there were those that were gentiles and then when they believed they became that same new nation in ephesians 2 we are told that he uh in himself he brought forth one new man that new man is the church and the point we're trying to get, pass across which comes so strong in first corinthians 10 32 is that the church of god is a nation by itself you see when you think about nations learn to think scripturally you see people that believe together People that believe alike, people that believe same same in scriptures are actually of the same nation. So the Bible will tell you to take the gospel into all nations, meaning all those who by their thinking have not yet accepted the gospel. You take the gospel to them. Why do we take the gospel to them? So that by believing, they come out of the nation that they were and they come into a new nation. Well, look at the way Peter says it. Peter, uh, First Peter and uh, chapter 2. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy 
nation. So everybody apart, sanctified nation. What is it that set the people apart? It is their belief in what God did in Christ. That starts the nation. You must learn to think about the church, the local church, right? as a nation on its own. It is the holy nation. It is the nation that God contains with. It is a nation started in the resurrection of Jesus. It is that nation that God said he would build. So that when Jesus said, I will build my church, he meant he was starting a new nation and he has started that nation. So we as believers, we as saints, we are meant to pay close attention to these things. Now, very quickly, look at Second Timothy. So 2 Timothy and chapter 2, we were trying to address a simple question yesterday that is of utmost importance. Now, uh, it's, it, you must understand this, that in the Bible, in the Bible, right, there is uh, something interesting. In fact, look, before you look at this 2 Timothy, look at 1 Timothy and chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Paul is saying to Timothy, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. So Paul told Timothy to wait at Ephesus. And Timothy waited. Why? He says, uh, where, did, where was Paul? Paul was in Macedonia. And Timothy waited in Ephesus. Why? He says that, that's First Timothy 1.3, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Wow. So when it came to, so if you have to ask what is the chief job of a pastor, it, the, the, the pastor jo does his job the best by observing the doctrine, which is what are people listening to or what are people being taught? Yeah. So can, it, can a pastor be aloof about what his people are listening to? Well, any pastor that's doing a job of feeding the flock will, will, will not be aloof to what the, church, uh, what the flock are listening to. But how, do, how can we help the saints understand the art of listening? When we listen to the word of God, how do we know what to listen to? Well, or what should be our posture? So in 1 Timothy 1.3, I want you to first notice that it was along the lines of doctrine or for the sake of purity of doctrine that Paul left Timothy in Ephesus. So if Timothy was organizing bazaars and raffle draws and uh, talk shows and the uh, barbecue nights, but uh, neglecting doctrine, then he has not done the job that he was meant to do in the local church. The pastor's job in the local church has a lot to do with training the saints and helping them to grow in, or in understanding what sound doctrine is like. So the, the, the pastor that has not trained the saints along the lines of sound doctrine is doing the saints a disservice. Look at Titus. Titus, now, why do I keep using Timothy and Titus? Because those are two ministers that Paul named by name, and he tells us what was important about them. Look at, at Titus, Titus chapter 1. Yeah, he calls him in verse 4, my son. Then he says in verse 5, for this cause left I thee in, in grief, that you shall set in order the things that are wanting. So who is it that sets in order the things that are wanting in the local church? Not God, funny enough. Not Jesus, funny enough. Not Apostle Peter, funny enough. Not Paul, actually. As mighty as Paul was, he could not bring about the change in Crete by himself. There was a man that he left in Crete, the local church pastor. And he told that church, local church pastor, hey, you are the one in Crete. And the reason why we've left you in Crete is so that you can set in order the things that are wanted. Right? A pastor, therefore, is meant to be somebody who is so strong in the apostles' doctrine that he can use the apostles' doctrine to bring about order in the local church. Now, what if the pastor himself is not stable in Paul's doctrine or in the, in the apostles' doctrine? Then the local church is going to be in turmoil. So, so it says here, it says in verse 5, For this cause let I think great that you shall set in order the things that are wanted. Notice, it is the pastor's job to be aware of what is wanted and to do something about it. Yeah, how? What, what should he do? Uh, firstly, ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now, uh, look at verse 10. For there be, uh, for there be, um, if I look at verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught. Notice, he's describing the men 
that Titus should ordain into ministry. It says they should hold fast the faithful word as they have been taught, that they may be able. So these are men with an ability. What ability? By, to use sound doctrine. Did you see that? So the leader, the pastor, the bishop, yeah, whatever name you want to call it, are men that have the ability to use sound doctrine to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So notice, they exhort and they convince. So a pastor needs to know how to use the Bible to convince. Yeah, the pastor needs to be strong in God's word enough to use the Bible to convince people in the local church. What does that mean? It means that people need evidence yeah, in the local church. So a pastor does so notice Titus was not required to say, well, I'm Titus, you all know me, just take it before because I am I said so. No. Paul told him, he says that you may be able to convince the gainsayers. Yeah, you must be able to convince the gainsayers. Notice Paul did not tell Titus to say what? Why are you guys gainsayers? He said, take it for granted, they'll be gainsayers, then you use sound doctrine. So sound doctrine is a pastor's good friend. And in fact, sound doctrine is the saint's good friend too. It says, look at it again. It says to convince. What, is the word, what does the word convince mean there? Well, the word convince, let me tell you what it means. It means, um, it, it says to bring something to light, to expose, to correct, right? To call to account, right? To demand or to give an explanation, right? So a pastor actually uh, corrects people and he brings correction through the word of God. Look at it again. Holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught. So a pastor is somebody who has been taught himself. And how is he meant to go about it? As he had been taught. Meaning if he has not been taught, then he will not be able to do this job. He won't be able by sound doctrine to, uh, to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. There is a large place that sound doctrine holds in the assembly of the saints. In fact, take away sound doctrine and all our churches are like social clubs. Now, look at verse 10. Why should the pastor be strong on sound doctrine? For there are many, not few, not some, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers especially they of the circumcision. So in the local church, among the people that teach, really, it says there are many that are unruly. So a, so a man or a pastor who does not follow apostolic doctrine is unruly. A, or a saint that, that, uh, sh, uh, that uh, chunks or shanks apostolic doctrine is actually unruly. How do we know? What it means to abide by the rule. It means the person is meant to be grounded in sound doctrine. Not just doctrine, sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? To say what Jesus said, the way he said it, and the way he taught it. Which is the way he taught it to the apostles, and the way the apostles wrote the epistles down. Let me say it again. Sound doctrine means you say what Jesus said, and the way he said it from the Bible. Or let's put it differently, using the Bible to say what, G what, what Jesus said, the way he said it, which is to say what the apostles said, the way they said it, which is to use what they say, the, what they had said, to say what they said. So we don't arbitrarily pick the Bible and make it dance to our ideas. That would be unsound. It could be logical, but it would be unsound. Sound doctrine is to take the Bible, take the scriptures, take the words of scripture, find out what Jesus has already said about it, then say the same. Find out what the apostles have said about it, then say exactly the same. When we do that, we are in sound doctrine. Now, it says there are many unruly and vain talkers, Titus chapter 1 and verse 10. Vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Whose, what did Paul say? Whose mouth must be stopped? Whose mouth must be stopped? What are the mouths that we stop in the local church? Remember, this is in the local church. Which are the mouths we stop? Those mouths that bring the saints into a doctrine contrary to what Jesus taught what the apostles taught, and what they taught their own disciples. Amen. It says, for, uh, whose mouth must be, must be stopped, right? Who subvert all houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy locusts gain. You know what? There's a reason 
why men teach what they teach. Let me put it in front of you. It means that unsound doctrine is evidence of materialism. Let me say one more time. Unsound doctrine, even if it doesn't appear so, yeah, it is a mark yeah, of that canality called materialism or covetousness. And who is open to covetousness? Every saint is. In fact, if you are not taught the sound doctrine, you will stay and abide uh, covetous. Although covetousness is contrary to what has been given to us in the new creation. Now, look at it one more time. It says, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert all houses, teaching things which they ought not. It, that means that it's not everything that is said from the pulpit that ought to be said. Right? Be why? Because if those things are unsound, then they should never have been said in the first place. But why do people end up saying those things they ought not to say? It reflects that there is filthy lucre or there is an unhealthy slant towards money and finances and covetousness or materialism. So materialism or a man's slant towards money ends up affecting what the man will say. Notice, Paul did not tell Titus to tell the saints that whoever is in front of you, accept what they say, hook, line, sinker. No. In fact, Paul, one of the reasons why Paul put leaders in the church is he put leaders who choose leaders and knowing that some of the leaders chosen might say those things they ought not to say. So how do you train the saints, therefore? You train the saints by helping them understand. You see, when somebody is in front of you in the local assembly, understand the most important thing that happens in the local assembly is that we gather around God's word. Number two, something happens when men begin to explain the Bible to you. Number three, it is your job to know that sometimes men say from the Bible what the Bible is not saying. Number four, you are responsible then to listen properly and begin to judge those things. Who is responsible? Number one, the pastor. Number two, the listener. So a good pastor trains the church to learn to think. A good pastor trains the assembly to learn to reason. We do not train, we do not train the saints to say that if a minister of the gospel is standing in your presence, then whatever he says goes. Uh-uh. We give the man or the woman who is preaching out in front there honor by listening to the man, by paying close attention. Wait, what if the person is saying nonsense? Still, you pay close attention. Notice, there's a difference between close attention and opening your mouth like a day-old chicken. Right? Christians are not gullible people, but Christians, because they are human beings, are gullible. <laughs> I just said two things there now. Christians, we do not inherit gullibility as an inheritance in salvation. We inherit gullibility uh, from our humanity. Human beings are influenceable by other human beings, even in doctrine. That is why it was Jesus, a man, that taught the apostles that were men, and the apostles that were men taught other men, and those men were to teach other men too. So man teaches man who teaches man, man, man down the line. Why? Because men are best suited to influence men. However, did the apostle just tell us, whoever is in front of you, just take it? No. They said there are some mouths that will open in the local church, and the pastor should see to it that that mouth is stopped. Oh, but what if the man speaking is the pastor's friend? Paul did not say you are to look at things along the lines of friendship. He says, whose mouth ought to be stopped? What, see, what if your best friend comes to church and he says he wants to preach? Well, you let him know that if you start saying what you ought not to say, your mouth will be stopped. You see, the pastor of the local church must never be afraid to take that simple thing called the microphone away from mouths that say what they ought not to say. Paul said, whose mouths must be stopped? Very easy. Whose mouth? You see, the power of deception is the fact that people accept it. If people will not accept it, then deception has no power. But first, we pay attention. And then as we pay attention, we listen well. In listening well, we then begin to judge what has been said. Let me say one more time. It is dishonor for somebody to be talking in the local assembly and you do not listen. What if the person is saying rubbish? You listen. When the person finishes, 
you then go in the word of God and you establish for yourself that what this person has said is OP. That means out of point. Right? You're not to say, well, the man got born again before me. While I was still in my spiritual diapers, he was already fellowshipping with Paul and Peter. No, 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 no. The spirit of the apostles was that if somebody was saying something that was not correct, they corrected it. Amen. They corrected it. Look at Acts 8. Acts and chapter 8. Quickly. quickly. Acts 8. Quickly. Acts 8. Are you there? Acts chapter 8. Look at verse 18. Or verse 17. Then Peter and John laid their hands on the people in Samaria, and the people in Samaria received the Holy Ghost. What, what does it mean by they receive the Holy Ghost? To receive the Holy Ghost there does not mean that you are first born again, then the Holy Ghost comes after. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That's not the way it happens. You are not a Christian except the Spirit of God is in you. If the Spirit of God is not in you, you are not a believer. Look at it again. Uh, all, all your hand in that Acts chapter 8 verse uh, 17. Look at Acts chapter, uh, that, look at Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, go all the way down to verse 20. Uh, Romans 8, go all the way down to verse uh, 19. Are you there? The rest of 19, sorry, 9. It says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. How do we know? If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So you can't say a man first gets born again, then the spirit of God then comes later. Uh, uh, uh. Sometimes we Pentecostals say funny stuff. No. What makes a man born again is that he receives the spirit, which is the seal of salvation. Yeah, The spirit of God in a man is salvation in a man. It's not that you first get saved, then the Spirit comes. No, the indwelling of the Spirit is salvation. Yeah. Now look at verse 11. If the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, so the Spirit of him dwells in us. And look at verse 9 again. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is what? None of his. So if you're a believer, then the Spirit of God is in you. Look at 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2 and uh, verse uh, 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things freely given to us of God. So a believer is one that has received the Spirit of God into him so that he now becomes the habitation of the Spirit. Go back to Acts 8. So Acts 8 and verse 17, yeah, when it says that they laid hands on them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost, it simply means that they laid hands on the people that they might take hold, that that would receive, that they might lay hold of the Spirit. Acts 8, 17. Very quickly. Acts chapter 8, yeah, Acts chapter 8 and verse 17. Yeah, it says they, it says they uh, laid their hands on them, that they, that means that the people that they laid hands on might receive might do what? That might receive the, uh, uh, the Holy Ghost. Yeah? That word receive there is a word that means to grip, to take, to seize. That means those guys already had the indwelling of a spirit. Now they laid hold of it, the Greek word lambano. So they took what they had and they used what they had to speak. Exactly. That's what it means to receive the spirit. To receive the spirit in Acts uh, eight does not mean that is when the Holy Ghost came into them. No. Whenever the Holy Ghost comes into a man, that's when the man is a Christian. When the Bible says that they received the Holy Ghost, it means they took the spirit that was in them and they used that spirit to talk. So, or they exercise the vocal abilities of a spirit. That's what it means to receive that. Look at verse 18 anyway. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of, of the apostles and the Holy Ghost was given, how did he do it? He saw it. That means it was something observable. It wasn't something in the spirit. It was something he could see with his physical eyes. So it says, 
in verse 18, when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, the apostle uh, the, uh, of the apostle and the Holy Ghost was given, he offered to do what? He offered to give them, uh, he, uh, <laughs> he offered them money. He offered them what? Money. Look at verse 19, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may, what? Receive the Holy Ghost. Yeah, on whosoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Notice, he may receive. That word receive there is still the same word, lambano, that this man or the people I lay hands on will take the spirit that they already have, just like the, uh, like the guys in Samaria are doing that, right? We know they already have the spirit because if you, if you read um, verse 14, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received, that word received there is not lambano, right? That word received there is like welcome. So the, the guys at Samaria had welcomed the word of God. So in verse 14, they, they welcomed the word. In verse 15, they are now to take that spirit that they already welcome. So they welcome the word, which means they receive the spirit as a new entry into them. So in verse 13, they were not born again. In verse 14, they welcomed the word of God, which means they welcomed the spirit of God into them. In verse 15, they are now to take the spirit that they had welcomed and exercise it vocally. Now, uh, and how are they going to be helped? The apostles will lay hands on them. Simon then saw it. Now look at verse 20. But Peter said unto him, your money perish with thee. So a pastor is somebody who is able to overlook money. Right? A pastor would not say, well, that guy there is our chief financier. He is the saint that gives the most. So therefore, if, he's, if he is giving bad example or doing uncool things, our eyes will overlook it. Such a person is not really a pastor. Yeah? But will you have saints? Who will want to use money to bamboozle the saints in the local assembly? Yes. Will they try it on the big apostle Peter? Yes. People don't care. They will try it. Why? Men are men. Just get it right. Men are men, although they are saints. Our inheritance in Christ is contentment. But our observation from the world, our, what we have inherited from the world, is a covetous, materialistic slant to things. So this thing followed uh, uh, Simon uh, the sorcerer uh, into the local assembly. What did Peter do? Peter said to him, your money perish with thee. Why? Because you are taught. Can you see? He's thinking. He said, you have taught that the gift of God may be purchased with money. That means saints are meant to think. Only that when they think, they must think correctly. It says you thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So Peter didn't say, ah, smart guy. You know the money anointing connection. He said, no, your money perish with you. Verse 21, for you have neither part nor lot in this matter. You see that word matter there is the word utterance. You, are, you, have no mat, you have no parts in this man, Eltras. That means in these things that you are hearing the people speak out by the Spirit of God. So when we are told they received the Holy Ghost, Peter qualifies it that what they actually had was that they actually spoke out utterance. Amen. But my point is this. Notice, Peter was the kind of guy that corrected clearly. And he corrected those thinking patterns that were not consistent. Notice, he didn't say, why did you think? He said, you thought this way. That was the issue. It says, that you, for you have thought yeah, that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Yeah, It didn't say, ah, this guy wants to give money into the coffers of the church. He said, no, your thinking is not straight. Your thinking is not correct. He says in verse 22, repent therefore. That means start thinking right. Let me say it again. You see, the chief thing that we are to encourage in the saints is to influence their thinking. In fact, the gospel is given to men, pro preached to men, to make them repent or to make them change their thinking. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness and pray God. Notice what Peter called wickedness. Wrong thinking is wickedness. Let me say it again. On the matter of doctrine, wrong thinking is wickedness. In other words, thinking wrong is immorality where doctrine is concerned. And by extension, therefore, many Christians are immoral. Why? Because many Christians do not even think. Forget about thinking. They don't think at all. 
What, what, and why is that? Because many Christians have been taught that your pastor does your thinking for you. So you ask those kind of Christians, why on earth was your brain not evaporated? You see, Jesus did not wipe away our brain. The blood does not blot away our thinking faculties. The blood removes the enmity in our minds. Then we are then to lend that mind to thinking correctly. Pure thoughts. Amen. Let me say it again. You see, uh, uh, our leaders are excellent men, and they are excellent to the degree to which they address and correct our thinking. But they are interested in the fact that we are thinking. Your pastor's job, my job in talking to you, is to affect, influence, correct your thinking. But what do I correct your thinking with? The, uh, the word of God. So how did Peter start? Peter started by, ah, this thing is a gift. Can you see? He says, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God may be purchased. In other words, it doesn't make sense. We called it a gift. Why will you purchase it? Can you see? So he's teaching in his rebuke to the guy, he's teaching the guy how to think. That if we say it's a gift, let the gift remain a gift. Yeah, don't sow for it. Let the gift of God remain the gift of God. If it is a gift, you cannot give towards it. You can give for the propagation of it. You can give uh, as, uh, yeah, but you don't give in order to be able to administer it. Uh-uh. Yeah, somebody says, ah, I'm giving to the minister so that I can understand what he's saying. My dear friend, ministry is free. Ministry is free. The word of God is free. Yeah, our service in Christ is free. Right? So somebody says, well, the reason why you give to the man of God is so you can understand what he says. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. It is a gift. Let the gift remain a gift. Hallelujah. Let the gift remain. See, when we start, see, is it wrong to give to a man of God? No, it's right. But you can give for the wrong thoughts. Peter did not just say, ah, Simon, this Simon guy, big giver. No, he, he looked at the guy's thoughts. So what is the job of my pastor? My pastor is to ensure I am a thinking saint. My pastor is not to say, don't worry, just keep short, keep quiet, say nothing. I talk, you say nothing. No, not at all. No, 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 not at all. You see, Jesus in the Bible is a question asking Jesus. And Jesus is a question answering Jesus. Look at Mark and chapter 4. Mark. And chapter 4, are you there? Mark 4, it says, um, uh, if you go all the way down to verse 10, and when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked of him the parable. So they asked Jesus questions about his teaching. Ah, look at it again. <laughs> look at it again. Jesus was teaching them. Look at verse 2, Mark 4, 2. And Jesus taught them many things by parables. One more time. Jesus taught them many things by parables. He said unto them in his doctrine. Remember, when saints gather together, why do they gather together? To receive doctrine. So good stuff. However, what do we do? How do we receive doctrine? Let's see how what the disciples did. Jesus, verse 2, Mark 4, 2. He taught them many things by parables. Then go all the way down. So Jesus, the wonderful teacher, he taught many things are parables. Verse 10. And when Jesus was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. In other words, they asked him questions about what he had taught. Oh no, somebody, see, that means a smart student. So when you go to the local church, you are to be a smart student. Remember? They cannot ask him questions about a parable that they have not listened to. Number one, Jesus taught. Number two, his mode of teaching was parable. Parable is a mode, a style of teaching. It's not the best style, but it's a style, right? So what was he doing? Teaching. What was he teaching? Doctrine. How did he teach it? Parable. What did the disciples do? They listened. What did they do after listening? They thought about it. How do we know? Because in verse 10, when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked him the parable. So they asked him questions. And verse 11, Jesus said unto them, Ah, uh -uh, me, son of God, the most high, almighty, El Shaddai. Don't you know who I am? 
I am teaching you and you are asking me a question. Shut up. Nope, that's not what he did. He said unto them, unto you it is given to know. How will you know? You will know to the degree to which you ask questions. So smart students in the local assembly ask their pastor questions. A pastor should make himself accessible to the people he has taught the word of God, knowing that after he had, they have listened to him, they are going to ask questions. Stop again. Look at verse 10. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. Verse 11. And he said unto them, no, 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 no. Uh, I cannot ask you that question. Go back to your notes. Uh -uh. He, listen to me carefully. How, what kind of teacher was Jesus? Jesus was a teacher that people could ask him questions based on what he had said. What is a pastor's joy that people are, are, are listening attentively, taking their notes, and in taking their notes, they are pondering what they are taking upon. And when they don't get what the pastor is saying, they come to ask questions. And when they come to ask questions, the pastor doesn't say, ah, come on, it's me that I'm talking to you and you're asking. So when I talk, you keep quiet. No, he talked, they asked. It was a dialogue. A pastor's interaction with his congregation is a long dialogue. It's a two-way street. He talks to them, they talk to him. In what they say to him, he give, they give him feedback. And what they do, he answers their question and clarifies. Look at verse 11, Mark 4, 11. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are outside, all these things are done in parables. In other words, I did not explain it well. I am going to explain it better. Wait, wait. Can a pastor explain what he just explained to the everybody in a better way? Yeah. A pastor's job is to keep on looking for the best way to communicate the same truth. So Jesus first gave it to them in parable mode. Then they came to him and asked him questions. So Jesus is somebody you can ask questions. A pastor is a question-loving being. When they asked him the question, Jesus then changed his mode. First mode, parable. Second mode or style. He didn't use parable again. Look at it again. It says all these things are done in parable to those outside. Now verse 12. Uh, that seeing they may see, not perceive, hearing they may hear, not understand. Can you see? So can people hear and not understand? Yes. Yeah. Why will they hear and not understand? Number one, it could be the mode in which it was said. Number two, it's that the, the fact that they never went back to their teacher to ask questions. They just, they, just, they just took what they heard and they went away with it. Imagine how many people would have listened to Jesus that day. And they did not know or they understand that he had just given them a parable. They would say, uh -huh, Jesus is into a Greek business. So there's a farmer. And the farmer throws seed on the ground. And they would say, yes. Was it broadcast method? Was it, uh, do you understand? Or, and they would have said, who said that? They would say, Jesus said it. Did he say so? Yes. What does it mean? They didn't find that out. Are you getting me now? So it says that hearing they may hear and not understand. So it is not enough to hear. It is important to hear, but not enough to hear. See, there's something in between hearing and understanding. It is questioning. In between hearing and understanding, you must learn to ask yourself questions. Did I get that? Do I understand the thought? Does it make sense to me? Is it clear or not? And if it's not clear, I go back to my teacher. Uh, you see, in the local, see, it, why is the local assembly different from tapes? In the local assembly, the man that taught you is meant to be among you. And because he's among you, you walk up to him and say, Pastor, look, Pastor, I took my notes. I listened to you, what you said uh, in that meeting. But please, I need you to clarify. The pastor does not then say, ah, after all my labor. You still didn't get it. Come on, get away. No. You know what Jesus did? Look at verse 13. And he said unto them, Mark 4, 13. He said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will you know a parable? The sower sows the word. So he changes the mood. He changes the mood. What was he doing? It was a continuation of the teaching he just gave. He now gave it in a clearer form. So a pastor is to look for the best way to explain the things he's explaining. What if the congregation don't get it? Well, you don't say, well, you must be dumb people. No, the pastor takes it upon himself to clarify. 
Why? The aim of teaching is not to bamboozle the hearers. The aim of teaching is to bring understanding to the simple. So what do we do? It is so, imagine when Jesus taught in Luke 24, he opened their understanding. He opened their understanding. Now in this place, how did it happen? They came to him and asked him questions based upon what he had taught. Somebody says, my relationship with my pastor is he talks, I listen, I keep quiet. You won't grow. You won't grow. What will happen? You will know how to take notes, but you will not know how to think things through. What does a good pastor do? A good pastor will say, while I'm talking, please listen, please take your notes, think and ponder on these things, and then if you are not clear, come back to me. Come, why? That is a pastor different from a traveling minister. Yeah, a traveling minister comes today, goes tomorrow. We're talking about a pastor, a pastor, somebody that you honor. The person you honor must have your time. Let me say one more time. The man you honor must have your time. You see, Jesus honored the disciples by having their time. They honored him by listening to him. Then they showed that honor further by having questions based on what he had taught them. Why? They are taught about it and it was obvious to them, uh, 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 this one is a parable. In other words, what this man just said is in a mode that needs further explanation. Amen. What this man just said, he has said it in a mode that needs further explanation. What is that? Honor. What is the aim of honor? That, they, that the hearers may receive ministry. That the hearers may understand what has been communicated. Let's start again. The local assembly exists to be a theater for the communication of doctrine. And the teacher will uh, faithfully give the doctrine. The teacher is watching the thinking pattern of the saints. The teacher is not just saying, I'm talking, you keep quiet, you say nothing. Mm -mm. The teacher, like, like, like Peter, Peter was watching out for her. Uh, Philip has been here. He's taught you guys the word in Acts 8. Simon now comes and begins to say all manner of strange talk. What was Peter watching for? Your thoughts. Your thoughts. Your thoughts. So a pastor's greatest weapon is his ability to decipher the thoughts or the thinking pattern of the congregation. My dear friends, that cannot be done on Facebook. That cannot be done on tape. Because the man talking, you are not with him. So can, can I learn from a teacher from afar? Yes. Can I learn from a pastor from afar? Not as well as those that are around him. But you know what is funny? Those around a pastor need to be trained to ask the pastor questions. Why? Watch again. So number one, they are to listen attentively. Because if you don't listen well, your questions will be shallow. So the level of my question should be the level of my thinking. My pastor should train me to ask good questions. How does a pastor train the congregation to ask good questions? Number one, he asks them to. Number two, whenever people come with questions, he answers it. What does that, what does that say? You bring the questions, I'll do the answering. You know what is funny? Jesus now spent a longer time explaining what he just taught. See, this is why people don't understand a message just because they heard it once, number one. Number two, people don't understand the message if a pastor says it once also. Let me say it one more time. There are two sides to the coin. The, the, the local church exists for doctrine. But on the hearer side, don't just hear it once. But when you hear, pay attention. You don't use one eye to be looking at uh, uh, the Premier League. And then the other eye to be, uh, or half the other ear. You're using it. One part of it is for uh, basketball, and the other, uh, and the other quarter is for the epistles. No, you won't get it that way. You give the word of God your undivided attention. You see, how do you listen to God's word? Imagine that you are in the office, and your CEO is about to give you a big project. You pay attention. That's the way you listen to God's word. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ears unto my sayings. So you incline your ears. You give it your utmost attention. What is the honor that the church gives to the local pastor? Easy. What is the local church about? Doctrine. What do we need in order for there to be doctrine? Teachers. What is the reason for the teachers? To teach. What is the other reason for the teachers? to, to uh, work out when people are listening to impure doctrine. What is the other reason? What, uh, how do the teachers do that? They listen to the thought pattern of the congregation. Now, uh, yeah, there are two things at that level. 
Yeah. Again, number one, why does the local church exist? It exists that men may know, uh, may, may receive doctrine. Now, number two, in order that men may receive doctrine, they are asked to be a preacher. Now, the preacher is meant to be sound in sound doctrine. How is sound doctrine uh, conducted? You teach and the people listen. Now, the people listening will then have a, an opportunity to think about what they've heard. Now, in, two things happen at that stage. The people that have heard might then, might then see that hey, we don't understand what this man just said. Yeah. And in that case, what do they do? They go to their local church pastor and say, pastor, I just heard what you said and I don't quite get it. The pastor doesn't at that point then say, uh, 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 I don't have your time. No, the local church pastor, because he is a pastor, not a hireling, because he's a pastor, will make a time for the congregation. Amen, amen. Praise God. Yeah, it will make a time for the congregation. Pastors are with their sheep. They feed the flock. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Feed my lamb. Feed my sheep. You get the point? Now, how did he happen the ministry of Jesus? They listened to him. They listened well. There were two sets of people that listened to Jesus when he taught. The first set heard what he said, and that's all they did. They heard it, and they asked no question. The second set heard what he said, and then pondered on what he said, then asked him questions. And then there was a way that Jesus responded to those that asked him questions. He also honored them further by teaching them further. Praise God. A pastor's joy, a pastor's thrill is to have a set of people in the local church that think. Praise God. I have a set of people in the local church that think. You see, let me say it again. The, uh, uh, the pastor exists to look at the thought pattern of the, of the saints. So when a pastor is thinking, when a pastor is teaching, he is thinking so that the saints can follow his thoughts. And in following his thoughts, they can judge it to be like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh Pastor, that one you said there is not in line with what you said before. Yeah? It's not in line with, you know that stuff that uh, Jesus taught about uh, uh, resurrection, about suffering? This thing you've said does not align with it. Then the pastor now says, ah, you are questioning me. No, that's not what the pastor says. The pastor should be happy. That it means the people are listening to you. It is not, uh, uh, some ministers say, ah, that is disrespect of the highest order. Mm -mm. A, a true pastor wants the people to think. You see, you are meant to listen to good men. You are meant to listen to solid teachers. You are meant to listen to sound doctrine. But after you listen to sound doctrine, you are meant to pause and think. Uh, because if you don't think uh, uh, and you outsource your thinking to other men, you will get into trouble. Yes, you will. There is nobody that God has authorized to do your thinking for you. You see, the local church is a theater for men to learn how to reason in the word of God. Go back to 2 Timothy. Oh, la, la. Look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy and chapter 2, verse 2. It says, and the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same, the same, the same, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The same, commit thou to faithful men. The same, commit thou to faithful men. So what do we look for in the saints? Number one, faithfulness. Then you take a faithful saint, you teach him doctrine. One more time, the faithfulness is an inheritance in Christ. And a saint is meant to actually give himself to that. Then as a teacher, as a pastor, what do you look for? You look for men that are exhibiting that faithfulness. What do you then do to them? You teach such men. And then among those that are faithful, you look for those that are able to teach others. Let me say that one more time. The pastor doesn't just say that because this guy is faithful, then he should be a teacher. Uh -uh. The pastor starts with faithful men. And of the faithful men, he pays particular attention to them. So in a congregation, you will have those, every single saint, he has faithfulness as a trait in Christ. But not every saint develops it. Then as a pastor, what am I doing? I am watching out among those that are in the congregation, which of them are faithful. Now, what do I then do? I take those men and I begin to set them apart and teach them to be able to teach others. 
when I notice that they can teach others, I then make them leaders. Then one more time. In other words, leadership in the local church is along the lines of how faithful men understand sound doctrine. But how do faithful men understand sound doctrine? They will have to think. One more time. The teacher teaches. The congregation listens. They listen attentively. They ponder what the man is saying. They judge it based on the foundational truth of the word of God. If it's not clear, they go back to their pastor. If the pastor cannot repeat himself, then he's not doing a good job. If the pastor cannot explain it better, he's not doing a good job. The pastor needs to be able to say it in a way that the congregation can get it. And what if they don't get it and they tell him? Then he looks for a different way to say the same thing. He's not going to change what he's saying. It's, it, number one, the pastor should not be saying those things he ought not to say. Right? So, pastor, what should I first do? I should make sure as a pastor, I'm a man that I've been taught myself. And then I should make sure I have been taught correctly. That as a pastor, I have taught through what I'm about to say to the people. Then I go to say it to them. When I'm saying it to them, the people are to pay attention. What are they listening to? They are watching how I reason. They are watching how I navigate the scriptures. They are watching how I put things together. Then they are taking notes. And they are paying close attention to the detail. As they are doing that, they are thinking about what they are hearing. Then they set apart time after the message. And they think it through. What if they still don't understand? Well, they go back to their pastor and say, Pastor, we know you've said what you've said, but we just don't get it. Then the pastor doesn't say, ah, ah, get away. No, the pastor now says, well, have you thought about it? They will say, yes. Do you get it? And they say, no. Then the pastor looks for a different way of emphasizing it. Or he just needs to emphasize it again. You see, sometimes as a pastor, we change mode. Right? You change mode. There, there are people that need to be taught, people need to be taught in the way they will understand, but they need to be taught. What they are going to be taught cannot differ from what Jesus taught and what the apostles taught. How they are taught is the pastor's job. That's why it's a service. Now, when the pastor is teaching, is he going to question their question in him? No. Somebody says, what? You questioned your pastor? Of course you should. Why? They questioned Jesus. And when they questioned Jesus, he answered them. Amen. He answered them. God asked Adam question. God asked Cain question. Jesus asked the Pharisees questions. Have you not read? Did you not see? Uh, he asked Adam question. Where are you? Ask Cain question. Where is your brother? And so, so what do men do? They ask him questions too. So men asked Jesus question. What did he do to their questions? He answered it. Amen. So Jesus, the pastor, Jesus, the teacher, is a question ask and screen teacher. But who are those that should ask questions? Those that are paid attention. See, what if I discover I was distracted when my pastor was teaching? It happens. What do I do? I get the tape. I get the message. I listen to it again. I pay close attention to it until I'm not distracted. I give it all my absorbing energies. I pay attention to them. Right? Or I pay attention to them. Look at this. Look at First Timothy. First Timothy and chapter 4. First Timothy and chapter 4. Look at verse, uh, uh, verse uh, 14. It says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by prophecy. Yeah, how? With the laying on of hands of the presbytery. So Paul and some other ministers, they laid hands on Timothy and they ministered to Timothy and they said some things, prophecy. Now, what happened years after? Paul is now writing to Timothy and telling Timothy, wait, Timothy, don't neglect what you have. In other words, the pastor's job will be, you remember those notes you took. Now go back to those notes and read them again. Why? Verse 15, meditate upon these things. To meditate means to ponder, to think upon, to think loudly. So pastors encourage their congregations to think. The pastor, so notice, Paul did not tell Timothy, just because I laid hands on you and I said it, that settles it. He said, no, 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 actually to the contrary. I have done my job. We have laid hands on you. 
We have spoken things to you by prophecy. Now the next move is yours. Meditate upon these things. So what do you do to words that are spoken to you by the presbytery in the, or the elders? That's what that word means, elders. What do you do with the words of the teaching of the elders in the local church? Wait, whether the elders are speaking in prophecy or whether the elders are speaking in prayer. But let me tell you something funny. You know that you are to be such a good student that even your pastor's prayers, you are listening to and taking notes. You know, some people think that, well, you pray just to, you are praying just to pray. No, a pastor is going to use every weapon at his disposal to train the congregation. So a good believer is saying, ah, look at the way pastor prayed there. Look at the words he used. Look at the way he structured it. Look at what came before what one. You are studying everything. You see, we study our pastor's jokes. We study, look, even if he's laughing, we study his laughter. Why? Every, you, you believe that the man of God is doing everything he's doing to aid your ability to receive. So what do you do? You absorb it. How, when I say absorb it, let, let, let me tell you what I mean. It says here, neglect not the gift that is in thee. So people can be taught or people can be ministered to in the things of the Spirit of God by words and they can neglect it. So why do you take notes? So that you will not neglect what has been spoken so well to you. So notice Paul didn't tell Timothy, let's convene the meeting again. Let's go and ask them to do the convention again. He just said, don't neglect what you heard. How will you not neglect it? It means that Timothy obviously should have written it down somewhere. So if you are to write down prophecy, how much more teaching? So what do you then do with it? You, uh, you don't neglect it. How do you not neglect it? Meditate upon these things. You think about it. So in between, you progressing or developing based on pastor's teaching and you're hearing it, there is your thinking about it. Paul never told Timothy, outsource your meditation to me or let me do your meditation for you or let me do your thinking for you. Timothy's job was to do his own thinking based on what he had listened to. Now, that means if Timothy was not a good listener, he will be a poor thinker. If Timothy does not take down good notes, then he cannot think well. Let me say it again. Why do you write down notes when the pastor is teaching? So that you can think later. If you are writing down notes so you can go teach somebody else, you are doing a great injustice to yourself. You see, nothing is worthy to be taught until you have spent your time thinking on it. You, what is your part when it comes to your teacher? You pay attention. Attention you give to a minister is the honor you give to the minister. When the man is speaking to you, you give him your utmost honor by listening to what he's saying. You highly esteem his words. And then what do you do? You actually then go back and meditate on these things. You meditate on these things and you give yourself only over to your meditation. Look at it again. So, see, pastor is teaching, you are taking notes. Pastor is teaching, you are pondering. Pastor is teaching, while he's teaching, you are following his thought process. You are, you are saying, okay, from this chapter, he went to that chapter, then to this place, then he went back, then he said this, then he said that. I'm taking note of what he's doing, right? That's how to listen. You know, some, some, some Christians, right? Uh, uh, when pastor is talking, like uh, when I'm talking today, all they will do is they will just write Second Timothy two two. Then they, then they wait. They just keep quiet, and then ah, he said Luke twenty four twenty five. Then the next line, ah, First Timothy one three. Then the next line, tight. <laughs> That's a ridiculous way to to list take note. That's no note. In fact, the note is not even you writing down scripture. The note will be your understanding while the man is talking. Why? Those become what you are going to use for your thinking later. Let me say it again. Me messages that you do not think about, or let me put it better, anything that comes to you via spoken words must be attended to by diligent study, which means diligent thinking. After it has been said, number one, it is said. Number two, you heard it. Number three, you wrote it down. Number four, you will now give yourself to it by thinking about it. Then what happens? Second, uh, First Timothy 4.15, that your profiting may appear. In other words, my understanding of what my pastor has taught 
is not a product of what is said, it's a product of my thinking on what is said. He gave me the materials by his teaching. I took down excellent notes. Ex See, note taking is not first Timothy 3 4, John 3 18, Revelation 2 2. No, that is a kamikaze. Or, uh, or, or an epileptic way of writing down notes. You know what happens? You should write down notes such that if you pick it up 10 years after, you can immediately go back into the meeting. Why? That is the way you take notes. You, you must take this note like, what if I'm going to pick this thing up in four years' time? Can I immediately see these words? And what I'm writing is taking me back to what I heard. That's the way to take a note. So writing down First John 4, 4, that's not going to give you anything. Yeah. So let's say I'm preaching to you and I say John 3 8, John 5 4, John 16 84, uh, uh, Matthew 59 99. So that doesn't help you. What helps you is the explanation. See, the devil also quotes scripture. You know, there's a film, The Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> I'm telling you that the devil does not only wear Prada, the devil also quotes scripture. The devil also quotes scripture in the local assembly. Just like you have that film, The Devil Wears Prada. Amen. So, because the devil quotes scripture in the local assembly, you then know that quotation is not the key. What was explained? That is what you are going to meditate on later. You are not going to meditate on 1 Timothy 4.14, 1 Timothy 4.14, 1 Timothy 4.14, 1 Timothy 4.14. No, there's no meditation there. The meditation is going to be, what did you write? What did they say? What was the explanation? What was the way that the things were joined together? What are you doing? You've now gone beyond. Pastor has talked to me. I've written it down. So now start looking. What are the implications of this thing that I just wrote? What did pastor mean? Is this aligned with what the scripture says? And somebody says, what? You are telling me to think on what my pastor said? Yes. Why? That is the greatest honor that the student can give to his pastor. You think on what they've said. The greatest dishonor to a message is to not think about it after hearing it. No. You think about it. You ponder it. My son, pay attention to my word. Incline the ears to my sayings. Amen. So it says in 1 Timothy 4.15, this is what Paul told big man Timothy. Let me say it again. Paul is telling Timothy, it is not enough for you that I prophesied to you. It is not enough for you that you took down notes. It is not enough for you that your notes were even clear. You must meditate on them. That means you must think. So pastor teaches, you pay attention, you write down notes, then think. And then from your thinking, you are then mixing what you have heard with what you know to be true from what is true in Christ. Thinking. The, the, the saint's good friend is that habit of thinking. You think things true. You compare spiritual with spiritual. So 1 Timothy 4.15, meditate upon these things. Give yourself holy. Notice, what are you meant to give yourself to? The thinking on what you have written. If you've not written it, you have not even started the job. Don't think about what you think the pastor said. Uh -uh. Write down what was said. Be clear about the thoughts. If it's not clear, listen to it again. Write it down clearly. Then now take your notes and now start thinking. Meditate on them. You give yourself wholly to what you are thinking on. It is the art of thinking that separates you to understand. Then your profiting appears. The understanding of what the pastor taught. Amen. The understanding of what the pastor... Look, it's very important. It's very, very important. Look, let's go back again. Because this is important. Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. Amen. Acts 20. Are you there? Acts 20. In fact, okay, Galatians. We'll come back to Acts 20 tomorrow. Look at Galatians. Don't forget, what was Peter doing when the congregation were around him? He was watching their thoughts. So a pastor or minister's greatest joy is when the saints begin to show themselves as thinkers. 
Or somebody says, no, out of respect for my pastor, once he says it, that settles it. No, it settles you to think. From teaching, we write, or from thinking, you pay attention. In paying attention, you write. In writing, you think. From thinking, understanding comes. If you do not think, you do not have understanding. You have excellent notes, but no understanding. You see, this is how God has put safety mechanisms in his word for the Christian. Look at Galatians 2. Galatians and chapter 2. Ah, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch. 11. When Peter was come to Antioch. I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. What, Peter? Hold your hand in Galatians 2. Quickly go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. Uh, uh, look at verse 40. Verse 41. It says, Then they that gladly received Peter's word. I want you to convince yourself by reading much earlier in Acts 2, that Peter was the one preaching. Yeah? So we know that Peter was the one preaching because if you go to uh, verse, verse 14, Peter, standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said, so Peter is talking, then go all the way down to verse 42 or verse 41, and then they that gladly received, that's honor, they gladly received Peter's word, were baptized, and the same day, there was added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now watch carefully. Who does finish preaching? Peter. Verse 42. And they, that means these guys, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Watch carefully. So they listened to Peter and they continued to listen to Peter. How did they do it? Steadfastly. They were not happy come, happy go, easy come, easy go, lucky uh, 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 proposition kind of guys. No, they continued steadfastly. How do disciples get made? They continue steadfastly. What were they continuing steadfastly in? In the apostles' doctrine. Now go to Acts 6. So they were continuing in Peter's doctrine. Now look at Acts 6. Yeah. And uh, verse, uh, verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It doesn't make sense that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye among yourselves, seven men, and they did that, that, that kind of stuff. Now, look at verse 6. Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they, the apostles, laid their hands on them, the people that were chosen. Now, but the point I want you to say is this. They said it doesn't make sense to leave the ministry of the word of God. So Peter was a man who had the best intention. He, he said it doesn't make sense for me to leave the ministry of the word of God. Now, let's see what that same Peter now did. Peter in Galatians and chapter 2. And verse 11, Paul then said, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. Now, be clear about this. When Peter comes to Antioch, Peter is not a tourist. So Peter would not have come to Antioch just to go uh, 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 snorkeling or deep sea diving or, or, or building sand dunes. Peter would have come to minister the word because Peter is a man that has given himself to the ministry of the word. What did Paul do though? Paul said, I wish to him to the face. So Paul is saying, here is Peter, a man, a pillar, the pillar, that Peter, the Peter, the great Peter, the one that actually, when he's talking, everybody listens. So, yeah, Paul then approaches Peter and withstands what Peter says. Now, in many people's books, Paul should never have done that. But, no, 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 that is not Peter's doctrine. Peter actually allowed that. That's why Paul could do it. Peter was a man that was welcoming of people, being able to approach him, yeah, on a matter. So when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now, look at verse, uh, verse 12. Before Satan came from, uh, from the James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of circumcision. So that means Peter's actions, which were his doctrine. You see, what a minister does in the presence of the saints is also as good as what the minister is teaching. Let me say it again. A minister cannot say, 
all I'm around for is to preach the word of God to you. But when it comes to my conduct, forget it. No, no, no. Somebody says, no, we do not preach our conduct. That is immature, right? We preach the word of God, but our conduct influences men. So Peter, did, Paul did not say, you know what? Let's forget Peter's conduct. No, he says, I withstood him to the face. So Peter's conduct was something that Paul took seriously. Our pastor's conduct influences us because our pastor's conduct is preaching in itself. It is the conduct of sound doctrine. If I preach one thing and do another thing, my doing yeah, messes up your thinking. Now, what must be done? Somebody must then start thinking, ah, look at what the man said. Look at what the man is doing. Mm -mm, that doesn't add up. Now, it says in verse 12, uh, we, we then see that fear moved Peter. Stop. Can fear affect the pastor? Yes. Why? The pastor is a man. And as a man, he can be influenced. What do we give him? Our attention. What do we give him? Our undivided attention. What do we do? We judge what he's doing or what he's saying. Really? Yes. Was Paul a minister by the time Peter started preaching? Nope. In Acts 2, there was no Paul. It doesn't, it doesn't get until Acts... Uh, Acts uh, uh, 9, when the, it is the people that Paul has, sorry, Peter has preached to. So Peter was a preacher. He, he taught disciples. They chose the seven. The seven went and preached to people. And among their disciples was a man called Ananias. Ananias, a disciple of the disciples of Peter, was the one that ministered to Paul. Paul is now a Christian. Paul now actually approaches Peter and disagrees. And Peter says, me? If not for me, will you even have been a Christian at all? No, that's not the, that's not the pastor spirit. A teacher of the word, by teaching the word, has made himself the servant of the audience. So the audience can come and question. How do they question? They will question respectively, but they will question. What do they do? They respect the man. What do they do? They question what he has said. If what he has said is, watch carefully, if what he has said is in violation of the written word of God. How would they get there? Thinking. Because if, he, if Paul was not a thinking person, now let me tell you the difference. Look at verse 12. Peter separated himself, right? So Peter was setting an example. Look at verse 13. All that Jews dissembled. So what are those other Jews? When pastor is talking, they take notes. After taking notes, they close their Bible until the next Sunday where they take notes again. And what do they do? They take the notes they've written and they straight away go to teach it to other people. Then the next time they come across again and they take the notes, they take good notes or bad notes and they go and, and tell it to other people. What are they not doing? They are not even stopping to think. So let me say it again. Your ability to say, what another man has said is not spiritual growth. It is you are to meditate on these things that you're profiting, your progress appears to all. Let me say one more time. In between listening and taking notes, active listening, there's thinking, there's meditation, there's pondering upon what you have heard. You are looking at what are the implications? What do these things mean? What does it imply? Is it Christ exalting? Does it actually emphasize the brotherhood of the saints? Is it another gospel? Is it another Jesus? Amen. A again, so in verse 13, we have, see, this is a local church, the local church at Antioch. Antioch is where Paul and Barnabas were pastors. But actually, arguably, a bigger minister than them came around, Peter. Because don't deceive yourself. Peter is on a level that Paul is not. When it comes to the universal church, Peter is quite on a level. It takes Peter to validate, validate Paul's teachings. If Peter did not agree, Paul's teachings would not have been taken seriously. Right? Now, but I wanted to see something here. Uh, uh, it says, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him. Now, Peter did something in verse 12, but there were certain people in the local assembly. What are they? Pastor says, I do. If pastor says it, I just do it. If it is said, I just go and do it. I leave the thinking to pastor because who am I to think? Now, those are the kind of guys that they dissemble themselves likewise with Peter. In so much that Barnabas, that kind of guy too, Barnabas was carried away with their, the, when the Bible says dissimulation, it, it means that they were actually acting. They were actors. You see? So Barnabas was an actor. The other guys were actors in the local assembly. Verse 14, when I saw 
Peter, Paul, that word saw means when I discerned, when I understood, when I had, that means he pondered, he thought about it. Peter did it, I'm thinking about it. Peter did it, Barnabas doesn't think, Barnabas just do, does it. Peter does it, uh, uh, and uh, others don't think the Jews dissembled straight away. And there's Paul. Paul says, Peter has said it, or Peter has done it, I'm going to think about it. Then what happens? I saw. So in verse 14, when I saw that they walked not uprightly, how? Is, is, Peter, is Paul just say, well, I just thought so. Uh -uh, that would be pride. He says, they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. So what are we meant to do when ministers minister to us? We judge what they are saying in the light of the truth of the gospel. Whenever fundamentals of the gospel are being violated, you know that you are listening to something that you cannot take too seriously. Let me say it again. He says, uh, Paul said, when I saw, yeah, he saw it. When I saw, not a vision. That word doesn't mean vision. When I saw that day, that means Peter, that means Barnabas, that means the people that are following him. Now, what would those people have been? Barnabas would likely be a note-taking guy too. So Barnabas would have taken notes and they would say, Pastor, do I mirror? Pastor does it, I copycat him. I copy and paste pastor. So if pastor says it's wrong, then it's wrong for me too. No. Do I take my pastor's words to be nothing? No. You are not a serious Christian if you do that. Every serious saint it's meant to hold this pastor in the highest esteem. The point is this. Is the highest esteem the absence of thinking? No. The highest esteem is to say, this man has taught me to think. So I'm not going to outsource my thinking. I will judge it in the light of the world. Even if 95% of people are following it, it doesn't mean I'm to follow. It means I'm to think. Meditate on these things. Give yourself wholly over to them that your profit may appear unto all. So, he said, when I, uh, uh, Galatians 2.14, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all. So notice, how did Paul arrive at what they did in verse 11? He listened to Peter. He watched Peter. He observed Peter. See, you are, it's not a knee-jerk reaction. It's not pastor said it one minute. You've not thought about it. You're already saying, I don't agree. No, no, no. You listen. You pay attention. The man in front of you as your pastor is worthy of you giving him the, the, uh, the, uh, the benefit of doubt. So you listen and you listen again. You, you, you listen and you listen again. You take your notes. You think about it. You ponder on it. And then with time, you then address it. See, he says, when I saw that they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, I said unto Peter before them all. Now, get this right. Yeah, it will not be your job as a saint to approach your pastor publicly and say, I don't agree. That's not smart. But you are at least meant to tell yourself in your mind that this thing that this man has said, after thinking it through, yeah, after, after thinking it through based upon the truth of the gospel. But somebody says, but is it not the same pastor that taught you the truth of the gospel? Yes. It means that you use what that pastor has done well before in the truth of the gospel. So now check what he's saying now. That's what you do. It is not about personalities. It's not about, ah, but the man, I hold him in highest esteem. Actually, highest esteem means I remember what you taught me well. I remember the truth of redemption. I remember the truth of the gospel. I will now take this thing and I will judge it by the truth of the gospel for that truth never fails. Glory to God. And he pondered. So no, notice, Paul said, when I saw, I'm not talking about Nijak. It's not, uh, Pastor, I, I, uh, uh, I listened to what you said this night and I don't agree. Uh-uh, what you? No. It's not I don't agree. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. Yeah. You listen again. You make sure you took good notes. You make sure you listen well. Then you approach. And you, what are you watching? You are listening to the way that the pastor himself is explaining it. Let me tell you, you don't need to be PhD Hebrew or PhD Greek or PhD Aramaic or DSC uh, theological or Christological studies in order to arrive at truth. See, the believer is a child of truth. You have the inward anointing within you that teaches you of all things. So when a man is talking, 
What do you do? You listen to the logic. You listen to the thoughts. Say, okay, it took this thought with that thought. Is that the way Jesus said it? One. Is that the way Jesus practiced it? Two. Is that the way the apostles said it? Three. Is that the way the apostles practiced it? Four. Is that what the pastor himself has said before? Five. And now why is he saying this? Six. Number seven. What is the fruit that this teaching is producing among the saints? See, I, I, you can tell there's a problem in this case because the saints were together in Galatia before Peter started this funny stuff. So Paul could use all those criteria. Jesus has said it. How did Jesus do it? Apostles have said it. How did the apostles do it? Now Peter is saying it. How has he said it? And how did he used to do? So what, what was Paul, Peter doing before? He was eating with them before. Oh, what is he now doing? He is no longer eating. Mm -hmm. So this is the territory. We now say, okay, okay. Now the next thing is, what is the impact of his not eating? Oh, schism, division, contention among the church, in the saints. Okay. So what do I then do? I tell my mind, that stuff that the man of God said, put it aside. Treat it as accursed. It's something not to undo. You've listened. You've given it attention. You've paid attention. You've actually given it the best uh, uh, option you have. You then go to your pastor and say, Pastor, I've heard you. I've heard Jesus. I've heard Paul. I've heard Peter. I've seen the examples. I've even seen you. You've said this before. This thing, I now see that you said this. Please explain, sir. And then the pastor explains it. What are you watching for? Not the Greek, not the Hebrew, but the thoughts. You are watching for the thoughts. What is this thing emphasizing? What spirit is it communicating? What is it actually achieving? What has it done among the saints? Then what you then do? You now take all those things back. You say, oh, okay, thank you, sir. You then take all those things back. You go sit down and meditate. In your meditation, you, have, you sit down and then you do your thinking. Praise God. Well, guys, it has been an absolute pleasure <laughs> to bring you the word of God tonight. Well, that was a mouthful, but I trust that we will be able to have a fellowship amongst one another again tomorrow.